Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, our final uh, presenter and keynote of the afternoon, our, of our closeout, uh, Making the Web Faster. Give it up for Patrick Meenens, uh, staff software engineer, uh, Google, and creator of webpagetest.org. That's a standing between you guys and beer. No pressure. <laughs> right, so I'm sure we'll just fire right through this, no problem, right? Um, so yeah, I'm here to just invalidate everything you've heard so far today. Say so we're not going to crawl any JS. We're not. No, seriously. Um, Luckily, I know nothing about search, and I know no proprietary secrets, so I can't divulge anything by accident. Everything I work on is all completely open source. Um, I primarily work on Chrome and web page tests, so they kind of go hand in hand, looking at websites to see what makes them slow and try and make them faster in Chrome, and then watch everyone slow them down again. And it's kind of a, a virtuous cycle that goes on forever. Um, so starting out a little bit and kind of explaining why I wanted to talk about performance here, and it's kind of about the next step in, once you get people to your site, you kind of want to get your money back out of them after you've invested all of this money in getting them there through your SEO efforts and everything else. And so there's always the, does it matter from a business perspective, and how much does it matter? Um, you'll see a couple of charts. This is uh, Sosta, now owned by Akamai, uh, has always been really big in the performance space. They've got a, a performance analytics tool called Mpulse. Um, if your customers of like Adobe, uh, used to be Omniture or whatever, um, try and push all of your analytics providers to tr start including performance data in with your business metrics, because that's where it's going to matter most. Um, one of the things that they're sort of famous for doing is plotting the business metrics against the performance metrics so you can see what the impact is. I've never heard a really good explanation for the very far left edge of the curve where when it gets really fast, the conversion rate drops to zero. Um, that's, that's usually been explained as probably error pages or something like that, but the, the parts you want to really focus on is the, the serious drop in conversion rate as the pages get slower and slower. And one key thing we're going to see kind of in a lot of the slides is right as you get to about the five second mark, which is right around here, it kind of tails off and you don't see it getting any worse. That doesn't necessarily mean, oh, hey, it doesn't matter if we get slower, we're already as bad as we are. It's sort of, if you're way out here at nine or 10 seconds, getting improving to like seven seconds is going to pull you over here and do absolutely nothing to your conversion rate, right? So it's when you get your users into the fast experiences, when you start getting sub five seconds down to one, two seconds, where they can really engage with the pages and have them flying, kind of like a real native app experience, that's where you start really seeing the business impact and the conversion metrics. Uh, bounce rate, very similar, um, although it doesn't have the same tail off that we saw in, in the conversion metrics. Um, but, I mean, we're talking about what it goes from 12% bounce rate all the way up to 58% bounce rate as your, your performance gets slower. If you look at all of the work that you do on a site, now granted, you still want to make sure you actually have content the users care about. I mean, you can make a really fast page that has nothing on it, but assuming you've got all of the content that you want to deliver, as far as ROI goes, the ability to drive your bounce rate from 60% down to 12% just by working on performance and optimization is huge, right? So when you're talking to the business about where to invest and you're working with the product people on features and things to drive more engagement with your site, performance absolutely should be part of that discussion. And there is ROI, you just need to be able to plot it against your own data to be able to estimate, hey, if we do this, we should see this kind of return on the work that we do. Um, these are probably a little harder to see. These are um, out of speed curve. This is web page test itself, its site. Um, just kind of an example where the numbers, the five second mark is not a magical number. Um, my users are apparently a lot less patient and come one second in the, so the top chart is time to first paint when they actually see, see something showing up. And the bottom chart is DOM content or page load time. So page load time around two seconds is already where I've lost all of my users. Um, so go figure, people going to a, a, a site about measuring performance really want a fast experience. <laughs> 
developers, we can be very, very picky about that. Um, one thing we did last year, as we worked with Sosta, we got a raw dump. Yeah, it, it's kind of funny. Working at Google, I had to go to Sosta to get data about usage of websites. Um, <laughs> But we worked with them. We got a dump of all of their data uh, with the performance and the business metrics. And we actually had all of the beacons that they have on the page, everything they collect, uh, region, device type, browser, um, vertical that the companies are in, and stuff like that. We threw it all at machine learning, because you know, sprinkle machine learning on everything, and magic comes out the end. Um, and we, we did a, a little bit of reverse work to figure out, OK, which of the metrics most directly, so the machine learning models did a really good job. They figured out and they could predict to around a 90% confidence level whether or not a given uh, session would bounce or not. Uh, bounce tended to be the easiest one. It translates and it's easiest to measure. And then we figured out which metrics actually drove that and it ended up, you know, you'd think maybe, okay, iPhone versus Android, that's gonna drive it. Uh, it ended up being the performance metrics were the biggest contributor, and with just two of the performance metrics, we could get to about 85% prediction. Uh, DOM content loaded ended up being the biggest uh, driver. If you're not familiar with it, DOM content loaded is the point where the browsers parsed all of the HTML and reached the end of your document. So it's run all of your scripts and stuff, but it hasn't finished loading the images. Loading all of the images and everything else, that's the, the full onload event. DOM content loaded is probably the closest metric from the field that we had in the data set to sort of the user experience for when they're seeing some content show up. That's kind of what we expect as to why we think it correlated better than the technical on load metric, which includes all of the, the analytics tags and everything else that fire. Um, but if you'll notice, we sort of have the magical five second mark again where everything tails off. And it's a huge, once you get Across the five second barrier, you don't go, hey, I'm done. It's, that's where you start seeing the really impressive performance gains where every second you shave off of there is an, an enormous improvement on, in the bounce rate. Um, if you ever need to make a business case and you haven't seen the site before, wpostats.com has every business case that anyone's ever talked about since 2007 give or take, that shows the performance work they did, the ROI that came out of it at the end. Um, it's really good uh, if you're trying to convince the business to focus on performance. So, uh, kind of a, a useless chart, but it's basically, you know, your, your, your uh, CPA, the, the amount of money you're paying for the actions, it's Gonna, you, you get the people in, the conversion rate directly drives that. So if you wanna drive down the cost per action, increasing the conversion rate, performance is a great, great way to do that, um, at least for paid traffic. So understanding how fast it is. Um, that's sort of been kind of the bane of my existence for the last 10, 15 years. Everyone wants sort of one magical number. Uh, instead, we give you like 50 magical numbers to tell you how fast your site is. You've got uh, sort of the old classic is the onload uh, page load time. There's DOM content loaded, speed index, time to first paint, time to first contentful paint, time to first meaningful paint, time to interactive. Um, I think that covers all of the ones we're throwing at you right now. I'm sure we've got a lot more that we haven't talked. Oh, time to interactive. We also have time to first interactive and time to continuously interactive, just because we didn't have enough. Um, so kind of boiling down what those are, and a lot of this has been sort of an evolution from what we'd consider technical browser metrics, the onload event, the page load time is the historic metric that everyone's ever used. That doesn't mean anything as far as what the user's seeing, that just means the browser finished loading everything that it knew about for the most part. And we found that, you know, historically that's the number we've always optimized for, but by optimizing for that, we were actually doing bad things as far as the user experience is concerned. We'd be concerned about getting all of the resources down as quickly as we could, do all of the work, and then display something, and giving a user a blank page for 10 seconds ended up being a faster experience in that metric than if we showed them something at two seconds and spent more time loading the rest of the stuff, even though the actual user experience was a lot worse. So over the years, we've been trying to evolve more towards user-facing metrics, and that's where you start seeing a lot of these paint metrics. So first paint 
is the point, the point where the browser displays something other than a white screen. For the most part, that could be just a background color. It doesn't necessarily mean it's anything the user cares about, but it is something that shows progress, something that the page is actually loading. First, Contentful Paint is a, a Chrome one only right now, unfortunately. Um, a lot of the other browsers are working on picking it up because that's easy, easy to define and it seems to have a fairly good representation of user experience as well. That's the first image or text that is painted in the viewport. So something other than a background. It could be a hero image, it could just be the text of the content, but something that you're trying to show to the user actually got painted. First meaningful paint is where things get a little more complicated. And there's not a whole lot of agreement, so I don't know that you should expect that one to be there long term, but it's the paint after the largest layout change in the viewport. And what that's trying to show you is the point in time where the main bulk of the user content got displayed on the screen. These are all sort of trying to give you point in time measurements where you can look at a film strip and go, aha, that's when the user saw the content that they cared about. And trying to do it in sort of a browser agnostic way. Timed interactive, we're actually gonna talk about shortly in a little bit more. Um, speed index is one that I've been pushing for a few years. And that's a lot harder to explain, but it's basically a weighted average of all of the paint of displaying the content in front of the user. And it tries to give you more, more benefit for getting as much content on the screen as quickly as possible. And technically it ends up just being the average time when pixels in the viewport painted. Um, so if you can get as much content in front of the user as soon as possible, your speed index will end up being better. We've been really good about making progress on the visual metrics over the last couple of years, and it kind of bit us in the ass a little bit. Um, so as we had uh, all of the JavaScript frameworks and stuff, as we started launching Angular, Bootstrap, and everything else a few years back, um, we'd have the problem where, okay, we've got these rich single page applications, but the user is staring at a blank screen until all the JavaScript can load, it can render the, the page in the, in the browser side and display it to the user. So the solution we came up with, and it's all the rage these days, right, is server-side rendered images or pages, where you render all of, the, all of the, the single page app on the server on the first view, send down the HTML, hook up the JavaScript to make the application actually work, and that way the browser can render the content quickly. Unfortunately, the hook up the JavaScript to make the page work means they're staring at the content, jamming on the buttons, and not being able to do anything. So we, by focusing on the visual metrics, we drove a faster visual experience. Unfortunately, we kind of regressed on the user experience side of things. And that's where Time to Interactive comes in. So Time to Interactive is trying to, to take the visual experience, and it adds on the amount of time it takes you to hook up all of the JavaScript and run all of the application code that you've got before the user can actually interact with your application. Uh, in web page test, this is sort of exposed down at the bottom of the waterfalls. Uh, there's an, a main thread interactive line. Anytime it's read, if the user tries to interact with the page, they're gonna get lag in what they're doing. So you wanna see very little red. And what timed interactive really measures is it just looks for the end of the red happening where there's like five seconds of green where the user can feel confident that what they're going to do and interact with the page, they'll actually get a response back. Um, in this case, not to throw them under the bus too badly, but CNN, one of my favorite poster children, um, all of the paint metrics happen around nine seconds. And then they're running 40 seconds worth of JavaScript. Um, <laughs> where the, if you've ever used the page, you can, you can feel it, um, but it's a completely janky experience anytime, you, anytime you're trying to do anything with the page, and so that's not a great experience. And that's sort of what, why there's a big push on timed inter interactive. Have you used it with, a, with an ad blocker? Have I used it with an ad blocker? Um, no, but unfortunately that's not gonna help a lot of users, and Depending on the application, we've seen it's, so in this case, CNN probably has a lot of ads. They also have a lot of video players and a lot of video stuff that they're doing, which aren't ads. They're actually their, their main content that they're showing and the video window that they kind of scroll off to the side and stuff. 
is that it's impossible to watch it with the out, without the ad blocker. Um, we also have a lot of like React apps and Angular apps and all of those where you'll see 20, 30 seconds of JavaScript execution actually hooking up the framework. And unfortunately, that you can't avoid if you're using an ad blocker. But yes, ad, ads, tracking beacons, all, all sorts of stuff sort of just pile on to the JavaScript execution. And hopefully, this will bring more visibility to them and hopefully get them to a place where they'll start using uh, request idle callback, which is one of the newer APIs where you can say, hey, give me idle cycles to do work that don't interfere with the user experience, for example. Timed Interactive, unfortunately, is not perfect. Um, and we're having some internal battles about this right now. So expect to see the metric evolve. Um, as it reports right now, Timed Interactive will probably look from the end of the page loading to see when the last activity was and it'll take that as your time to interactive. Um, in this case, this is a Facebook page that's really, really good. You'll see it's like almost completely green, uh, visually loaded in 10 seconds. This is on a really slow connection in case you're wondering why it takes a minute to load. Um, but it was completely interactive for the full minute that it was loading all of the images and everything else. And then at around 50, Five fifty-six seconds, it fired an onload handler that happened to take around 200 milliseconds. And that blocked the main thread for enough that the time to interactive metric ends up being 49 seconds. Whereas you can see, in reality, the page was actually completely interactive for the whole time. So that's kind of why the time to interactive is split right now. There's a first interactive, or it might be called first idle, depending on what tool you're looking at which kind of looks towards the, the beginning of the waterfall to see when it's first interactive. And then if you're feeling really pessimistic, you can look towards the end. Uh, but for the most part, what I recommend is when you do your testing, just kind of eyeball the waterfall and look for how much red or green you see at the bottom. And if you see a lot of red, um, maybe go look at how much code you're running and if you really need it all. Um, I should point out, Above in the waterfall, you see all the pink, the, the pink lines after the resources and web page tests. That's JavaScript execution. Hopefully, it makes it fairly easy for you to find out the culprits and who's executing all of the JavaScript. You can just go up and look and see, hey, there's an awful lot of pink coming from that one ad or that one JS file. And you'll know where to jump to in DevTools. I'm guessing almost everyone in, oh, quick question. So why do we only care about time to interactive and why is the rest of all of this loading not counted in the metric? Um, so in this case, so time to interactive is based on first meaningful paint, so it won't start until the main content has initially displayed. The rest of this stuff that's loading, um, you, you don't see it because I had to clip it out so you could actually see the waterfall. It's a fairly long page with a whole lot of images on it. And most of the stuff that's loading is below the viewport. You might care. That's why there's not sort of, don't use one metric that you look at. You kind of want to have a collection of metrics and watch them all. You still care when the full load time is, but you really want to make sure that the user, as soon as they can see the content, and they can see the content at 10 seconds, you don't want to have them to have to wait till 50 seconds before they can actually start scrolling and interacting with it. You want to make sure that as soon as they see it, they can actually start interacting with it. And like one of your metrics doesn't throw off your other metrics. Kind of gamification, if you would, or gaming the metrics. If you hold me as a developer to, hey, I want my first paint to be as fast as under three seconds, I will find out a way to paint the screen for you in three seconds, even if it makes a horrible user experience, right? And so, especially if it's my OKRs uh, for, for my bonus or whatever. Um, so <laughs> make sure you're incentivizing people to actually do things that improve the user experience and not just to optimize a metric. Um, I was looking around earlier. I'm pretty sure most everyone in here has what we'd call a high-end phone. Uh, saw a lot, a lot of iPhone Xs, 8s, um, high-end Android devices. The spread in CPU uh, performance in devices is insane. 
uh, especially when you go between mid-range and Apple in particular has done an amazing job with their new, new chips. So up at the top is the, the latest Apple's, the iPhone 8, the iPhone X. This is the amount of time it takes to execute the JavaScript on CNN, um, just so you have a, a real world baseline. Um, this is 30 seconds out here. Um, so the, the current iPhone 8s can do it all in about 10 seconds. Mid-range, um, even the Samsung 7 is 20 seconds. So what we generally recommend is your experience will not match the experience of a lot of your users. So the first thing I always hear from someone uh, after they've run a test on web page test, for example, is my site isn't that slow. Um, I'm loading it right here, usually on my really fast desktop, on my really fast connection. Um, but so <laughs> realize the experience that you have is not the same experience that your users are having. Um, if you can, um, spring for a couple of these. These are the Moto G4s or some other $100-ish range phone and use that as a test device. Uh, if you can, hand it out to executives to play with on your site and see what the experience is because the amount of time it takes them to execute JavaScript is a good amount slower than it is on your, your fast phones that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are the kind of phones that your users are actually using. So now that we sort of understand the metrics that we care about, it's like, how do you get them? How do you measure them? I was talking to you earlier about your Adobe Analytics or your other performance tools. Google Analytics does collect some performance data, not as much as uh, something like Impulse, which has a lot of uh, paint metrics and stuff like that. But if you want to get an eyeball idea of what your performance is like, um, there's a speed section in your Google Analytics data, if you're using Google Analytics. Um, by default, it will show you averages. Averages suck. Uh, look at the distribution data. It'll tell you the histograms, and you can see what the distribution of your performance is. Um, I also recommend generally looking at the DOM content loaded time. Uh, as far as the metrics that Google Analytics collect, it's probably the most representative. There's also the, the page load time in there as well, but that's less, less user facing. If you can, um, try and get real performance data in with your business metrics from a tool that's kind of geared towards measuring it and that collects your first paint in particular. That's a really important one to see from your field data. Time to interactive, uh, speed index, some of those, they're only available in a lab. Uh, you can't get those from the field now, unfortunately. Hopefully they will soon. Um, and this is a big thing. I used to, maybe 10 years ago, I was thinking, wow, we're making really good progress with the metrics that browsers expose to the field. It's only a matter of time before we don't need to do lab testing anymore. Hey, I'm out of a job, no more web page test. Um, ends up that's not so much the case. Uh, the lab testing is really nice because it's consistent. There's no environmental variables changing around you from day to day, hour to hour. Um, I mean, you've got the, the site itself changing or server performance, but that's the stuff you're trying to measure. What you end up getting in real user data is you'll get one of the ones I had when we were at AOL that was always fun to explain is every summer the performance would change radically when kids were no longer in college and they were all of a sudden at home and they weren't on fast internet connections anymore. Um, you see that sort of more at a micro level when you have weekend, weekday uh, performance variations where people are at work on really fast connections and then they go home and they're on slower connections or vice versa. Um, and you have to try and cross your eyes to understand what the trends and performance are when you're looking at your real user data. So generally, when you're trending your performance and you want to look for variations, lab data, uh, synthetic testing tends to work better. If you want to understand what the user experience is and what they're seeing and kind of get a baseline for it, look at your real user data. Um, you need both. You can't sort of get by with, with one without the other. And generally, if you want to compare yourself um, against a competitor, uh, Amazon versus Walmart kind of a thing, um, <coughs> Historically, you can't do that with real user data. You can only do that with synthetic. So you can run in a lab, you can run your site against your competitors and set benchmarks and say, hey, out of our, our, our category that we're in, we're third out of five in performance. We want to boost up to number two or something like that. 
I do say historically um, because last month uh, the Chrome team released the Chrome user experience data report. It's in beta right now, so it's a limited data set. It takes, I can't remember if it's the top 10,000 sites and 10,000 random sites or 10,000 total, 5,000 top sites and 5,000 random. But what this is doing is all of the users have, that have agreed to share Chrome data, um, this is most all users, we are now publishing on a per domain level the performance of a site and full histograms of the data and we put it in BigQuery. So you can do analysis against all of the Chrome user base and the performance on all of the domains that they're seeing. Um, it's split out a little bit and there's not a whole lot of metrics, but the ones I care about, first paint, first content, full, full paint, DOM content loaded are all available in the data set. And you can start doing real user comparison data of you and your competitors now. Uh, so this is a plot of the histograms of Amazon versus Walmart, for example. Uh, Amazon is blue, Walmart is red. And you can see for the Amazon domains, for their users, you can see how much faster they are uh, compared to Walmart, for example. So if you're looking at your data versus your competitor data, you can now see it in real user data and see what the real user experiences are. That said, it still has, you still have to squint and go, okay, well, how much is there a demographic difference between Amazon users and Walmart users? Uh, Amazon.com, how much interna international traffic, how much U uh, US traffic? Since it's on a global domain level, if you're using like Google.com to compare against, that's not just gonna be search, that's gonna be anything that's on the Google.com domain, including Gmail, right? Which is Google.com slash email. Um, so just, just be careful what you're looking at when you're doing this kind of domain level comparison. But it's an awesome, awesome data source for being able to look at real user performance globally for basically all of the Chrome users. Um, and you can also do it on a, on a per, so this is Amazon looking at their main domain traffic versus Japan versus India. You can see Japan and um, global or blue and green whereas the India traffic is red, and you can see how it skews off to the right a little bit. Um, the big spikes you see at three seconds and 10 seconds aren't actually spikes. The bucket sizes change from 200 millisecond buckets to 500 milliseconds to five second buckets. So it's just bigger buckets, more data. Um, they aren't actually spikes. As far as uh, performance testing, in synthetic, uh, we have webpagetest.org slash easy is probably the easiest place to go to get started with all of the sort of recommended parameters. There's a mobile profile and a desktop profile that have sort of all of the connectivity options pre-selected for you. And the mobile tests will run on real, on Moto G4s uh, that we saw earlier. So you can see the real JavaScript execution in the field. Um, so off of performance testing, one of the questions I got asked when I, I sort of queried people that were coming to see, hey, what do you wanna hear about? Um, out of the best practices that we've been told for making websites faster, what's changed in the last 10 years? So these are uh, Steve Souders, if you're not aware, back in 2007, uh, he used to be at Yahoo, created High Performance Websites, the book, and sort of started out the whole web performance industry. And these are all of the optimization rules that were in his original book. They all still hold true. <laughs> I mean, it mostly boils down to ship less stuff to your customers and what you do ship, try and deliver in an optimal order. And none of that has changed in the last 10 years. Um, reducing the DNS lookups, avoiding redirects, I mean, all of it translates. The biggest thing that's changed in the last 10 years is HTTP2. And that does impact some things that may or may not be best practices, but that we've been doing uh, quite a lot. One of the big ones is what we call connection sharding, where you would take, so browsers in general were limited to loading, well, we limited ourselves to loading six resources per domain at a time. And so if you had a site that had a lot of images on it, for example, and you didn't want to, you wanted to be able to load more of them in parallel, you'd have like images two dot 
CNN, images 3.CNN, images 4.CNN, and then the browser would open up connections to all of those, six connections to each of those, and now you can download 24 images in parallel. It was never a good idea to do that. Um, <laughs> it's worse of an idea now. Etsy had a good blog post that they put on. Uh, the links are all available as we share the deck later, but one of the things that we, we tested when we, with Etsy is they had their domain sharded and what you see here is a TCP dump of the page loading on a 3G, was it a 3G or a DSL connection? Uh, might have been a DSL connection at the time. And what you see is the green chunk of data is what we call spurious retransmits, where it's retransmitting the same data that never reached the client, but that ended up making it to the client. So if you've ever, ever heard of buffer bloat, this is what buffer bloat looks like in a picture. It starts sending the data down, the connection starts getting fuller and fuller, and it takes longer for the packets to get to the client. The server thinks the client hasn't seen it, so it starts resending it again, filling the queue even deeper, and it keeps burying itself to the point where over, over half of the bandwidth is wasted and just sending duplicate data after itself because of the connection sharding was overflowing the connection. With HTTP2, it's even a worse idea because one of the biggest things that you get with HTTP2 is prioritization and resource delivery over a single connection. When you do the connection sharding, there are ways around it, but if you connection shard, all of a sudden you're sending requests to a bunch of connections and you're trying to prioritize across all of them and that can't happen anymore. The, the good case in connection sharding with HTTP2 is if you have a shared certificate and the DNS ends up pointing to the same servers, HTTP2 will coalesce and it will take those subdomains and fetch them all from the same original connection, but you still have to pay the DNS lookup for those cases before it can figure out that it can connect, co coalesce those connections. So in general, you're better off just serving everything from one domain and not doing that anymore especially if you're going to HTTP2, but even pre-HTTP2, so what Etsy did here was pre-HTTP2. It wasn't a very good idea to do sharding in general. Um, another one that's used to be a recommended practice is just a bad idea. Um, cookie list domains for static resources to have a CDN domain that you use to serve all of your images, your JS or whatever from, because cookies could be big and you didn't want to upload them for every request if the stuff you're downloading doesn't need cookies. HTTP2 uh, largely eliminates the overhead of cookies because it compresses them away. After, after they're sent the first time, they never get repeated again. So there's no waste in using the, the connection over and over again. The other thing that you pay uh, when you're using a separate domain for your static resources is you deliver the HTML and then you say, hey, all my static resources are in this other domain. The browser then needs to do the DNS lookup, the socket connect, and the requests for the other domain, and that adds three round trips before you get your critical content, especially if you've got your CSS and JS off on that other static domain. So you're wasting three round trips that you wouldn't have to waste had you been serving it all from the same origin. So these days, the best practice really is to serve everything over one connection that's on the same domain as your base HTML, um, which largely means you're routing your CDN traffic, um, you're routing your base page through the CDN as well as all of your static resources. They all support it these days. Um, you don't really have to, they used to, like Akamai used to upcharge for DSA and fancy routing and stuff like that. I'm sure they probably still do, but they all support serving dynamic content through the CDN um, so one domain is the best way to do it. HTTP2 was really designed to work off of one domain. When you have multiple domains, it sort of, sort of starts to fall apart because the prioritization no longer works right. Repeat offenders, things that we see constantly causing performance problems. Um, I'm sure this is gonna upset a fair number of people. A-B testing. <laughs> If you're doing your experimentation through JavaScript framework that you injected into the page, stop. You need to do your A-B decisions on the server before you send the HTML to the client. 
Doing it in JavaScript in the client is the absolute worst place you can do it, especially if it's blocking all of your content. So JS in the head of your document making A, B decisions about the rest of the content, it has to block the rest of the content until it can fetch that JS and make the A, B decision and then load your content. Um, the biggest culprit here used to be Optimizely. Um, it makes it easy, right? Drop a JS tag on your page and you can do whatever you want. Um, as developers, we hate you for that, but um, <laughs> they have a backend solution now. So please move all of your A-B testing to the backend. <laughs> Tag managers, <laughs> they're evil. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know we just heard about all the sorts of cool things that you can do with Google Tag Manager. Um, they can be good as long as they're loaded asynchronously and everything they're doing is asynchronously. If you have a blocking tag manager in your head that's then injecting more blocking scripts in your head, unfortunately, it's a common problem and it's horrible for performance. Um, now I'm gonna fire through the last couple because we're out of time and there's beer. But I'm gonna give you a couple more really quickly. Um, so AMP, just because I wanted to touch that third rail. <laughs> um, one of the good things, so beyond the pre-rendering, one of the things that you get with AMP surf from the, the cache is that there's already a connection made from like the search results page to the CDN that's serving the AMP content. And the AMP JS is already preloaded. So even in the case of a non-pre-rendered case, you're loading all of the content in a single round trip. There's no DNS, no socket connect, no TLS negotiation that needs to happen. So in most cases, I've seen the AMP content rendering even on slow connections in under one second for pages where the non-AMP version takes seven plus seconds. That said, if you work really hard, you can still build a slow AMP page. Uh, and I have seen them. Uh, if you make your entire page an image, given that AMP lazy loads images, that's a really bad idea. Um, you can load hundreds of custom fonts within that 50K of CSS. Also a really bad idea if you want to ever see text display. But for the most part, what AMP gives you, as a developer at least, is a stick that you can go back to the business and say no. Because you can say, sorry, I can't do that in AMP. So when, the, when they say, hey, can you insert all of these tag managers and everything else, you can say, nope, sorry, it's AMP. Um, and gives you sort of a, a pushback on being able to do that. And the final one, uh, PWAs, they aren't just about offline, uh, progressive web apps, service workers. One of the more common, uh, one, of the, one of the things I'm most excited about seeing, so PWA uh, service workers gives you a way to intercept all of the requests that are happening from your page, even if they're third party requests. And one of the coolest things that you can do with something like that is you can implement your own stale while revalidate, which for something like Google Analytics, which only has a two hour cache life, one thing that you can do in your service worker is always serve the cache version of Google Analytics immediately, for example, and then in the background fetch the newer version. And you can do this for sort of all of the third party tags and you can also in, impose SLAs and say, hey, if it's not coming from my do domain and it took more than a second, I'm gonna fail you immediately and maybe log it and start putting hard clamps on what the third parties are doing on your pages. That's it, so I'll be around. We can talk over beers. <laughs> um, anyone on the live stream, feel free to tweet at me, at Pat Meenan, I'll answer questions there as well. But thanks. I guess. Well, it looks like we have time for maybe one or two questions. I mean, I'm happy to take questions while you're having beer, too. <laughs> Although the, the quality of the questions may drop down, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, the last bit that you just mentioned is really interesting. So with the service worker, can you dictate the local cache for third party resources? I mean, I, I know that it's best to have like everything on one domain, as you mentioned, but for example, let's say you don't want to host like JavaScript libraries, like jQuery or like Angular stuff, you want to keep them on any like, you know, CDNs that always have the last version or whatever. Yeah, I mean, so service workers, the really cool thing is you can do anything you want. 
So even for a third party request coming in, from a service worker, what you'll see is you'll see a request for say, cdna.jquery.com or whatever, right? And the service worker can do whatever it wants with that request. It can go out and pass the request through and just watch it. It can make its own request. It can send back whatever random cache data it wants. It can make up data. Uh, one of the other th cool things that you can do is you can race uh, multiple requests against each other. And so say you're seeing the jQuery request come in and you can request it from your CDN, a third party CDN, and even your origin server. And whichever one comes back first, you can send back, you can cache it, you can do anything you want with it. I mean, it's a man in the middle proxy that you're controlling in JavaScript that has access to every request on your page. The one thing it doesn't have access to is anything happening in iframes, because iframes are considered separate documents. But it's one of those things where the power is absolutely amazing. You can also shoot yourself in the foot really hard if you screw something up, because you are intercepting every request on your page. And let's say you ship something that's blocking your main pages from loading, you can't undo it. Um, service workers have a, a, a 24 hour fail safe where they will always refresh themselves in 24 hours. So the mo most you can kill yourself is 24 hours, but that's an awful long time to kill yourself. So I know I, I, I broke technical <laughs> lots of power, <laughs> lots of responsibility, but you can yeah. do some really awesome things with them. I, I broke technicalseo.com. I launched a new tool on it and nobody could see it because <laughs> they all had visited the website before and the blank page was cached or whatever. So, but cool, thank you. Awesome. Uh, about the Chrome user experience report. Yes. Does that capture stuff, uh, metrics that you can't capture with just like JavaScript, for example, on your own page? So Chrome user experience report does not capture anything that you cannot capture through JavaScript if you own the page. What it does give you is visibility into pages that you don't control, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, so TripAdvisor, you can see their performance in the Chrome user experience report because you don't control the JavaScript on their page. You can't right. instrument it. And but the metrics that it collects are all available through JS. Is there any uh, plans to add something, add anything that you can't collect through JS? Are there plans to add anything? No, um, there are plans to add more metrics to it, but all of the metrics that we're talking about adding to it are also going to be exposed to JS. So as we talk about like time to interactive and finding a way to expose that, that will also be made, made available to JS on the DOM. So for the most part, anything that you can get through the user timing experience report, you should be able to get through uh, performance timing in one form or another. Great, thank you. Go ahead. I was gonna, this might be a better beer question, but <laughs> uh, so you have, you have visibility into these types of metrics that I don't have unless I own the page. What if I want to have that kind of visibility into other people's websites? Can so I, can you I run a copy of it as like a service? That's like, what the Chrome Experience Report is. It's public. Um, everyone has visibility into everyone's performance. So TripAdvisor now has visibility into your performance. You now have visibility in TripAdvisor's performance. What if I wanted to run that at scale? Like, what do you mean by run it? It's a, like, it's a data source. You query it. You query it as much as you want. It's in BigQuery. OK. <laughs> now, I will say BigQuery will charge you for the queries. Um, you can probably find a way to scrape the database locally and do whatever you want with it. But yeah, I mean, it's a public data set. It's updated monthly. Um, the original data set that was dumped, like I said, is limited. Um, the next dump is supposed to have every domain that has had more than 50 hits in the month. So pretty much anything out there should be in the, the experience report. One more question and then I think beer time. <laughs> uh, this is an extension on a conversation we had last night. Um, we've been told now with HTTP2 there's you know, magically no overhead with making lots of little small requests and you know, we don't have to bundle sprites and all the things. Um, but you said differently. Could you go into why that isn't as free as been, has been previously advertised and what maybe like how impactful that those 
performance at SAR? Certainly not, not as free as hoped, I guess would be a, a way. The, the hope was all of a sudden you could start unbundling and just ship everything down raw. Um, it turns out that there's a lot more overhead than just the network. Um, just to rattle off of a few, when you have, I, th I can't remember if it was Code Academy or someone basically tried shipping and they had 200 uh, separate JS files instead of three and performance tanked even on HTTP2. And it ends up, um, you know, the disk seeks for checking the disk cache for 200 resources is a lot slower than checking the cache for three resources. Um, internal to Chrome, uh, this may be a Chrome specific problem, uh, but we have two processes, uh, the renderer, which is what you look at, and the underlying networking stack run in separate processes. And they talk over IPC communications. Um, every one of those requests is at least three IPCs back and forth. And so you go from three round trips internally to 200, all of a sudden you start getting more overhead there. On the network side, um, there was a f improvements in, or the compression got a lot worse because each file is now gzipped individually, whereas previously you had larger files that had a dictionary that would be learned and would compress a lot better as a single larger file. Now there is work going on to try and mitigate as many of those as possible. Um, like HTTP2, they're talking about doing shared dictionaries where the connection can learn over time. So delivering 200 resources over the network won't take more bytes than uh, two resources or whatever. Um, I don't know that disk cache is ever going to be completely fixed. Hopefully, maybe everyone will have SSDs and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, the IPCs, there's work on batching a lot of that. So hopefully, it's going to get better. Um, you're really at the point where instead of just having like one JS file, you know, a few is fine and it makes sense to have like a central one and maybe a, a theme or a, a template specific one and two or three, uh, 200 is overkill. Uh, so find a, a nice, happy, small number that works for you. And the other thing, the big HTTP2 promise that sort of fell apart was HTTP2 was supposed to solve the, the prioritization problem and the fetching problem because now every, everything would be on one con connection and the server could see everything and it would prioritize everything in the right order. Um, it turns out we have a crap ton of third parties on our sites. And so even with HTTP2, there's still like 50 connections that everything's loading off of and we still have prioritization going on across a whole lot of different connections. So the real world is a messy place. So half beer, I will be up here. I will be mingling around if you have other questions. Oh, and back to our hosts, sorry. <laughs>